This is the starting of my greatest fear I'm all packed up, getting out of here Okay, Psalm 27. What's the theme? What's the point of this psalm, Psalm 27? It's a psalm that concerns itself with something that affects, maybe afflicts, the bulk of humanity. Okay? And it arouses a great deal of uh, contemporary interest. It addresses the issue of human confidence. Now, how many people don't like confidence? A lot of people lack confidence, not, often not the ones you'd think were okay. And you really lack any confidence, but they're just good at pretending. It's a really common human issue. And this psalm addresses that great big issue. Do you know, I found this, because <clears throat> I did a Google search. <laughs> there were more than 40,000 articles about self-esteem in newspapers and magazines in the US between 2002 and 2007. 40,000 about confidence and self-esteem. So this is a song from a long time ago, but it deals with a problem for the bulk of humanity since a long time ago. There's not something new that's going on. It's, 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 it's a vexed issue lurking within that human sense of insecurity and the painful sense of insecurity that fits us all in the sort of world that we live in. We live in a very insecure sort of world. And therefore you get knocks and confidence, therefore, is hard to come by. I say it affects all of us. What I mean is all of us who are normal. Because it can be the case that people have something malfunctioning in their brain. Maybe there's been some organic brain damage. Maybe there's been an operation done or something or other. And alongside that, you get an altered state of uh, confidence. Um, and that can be quite dangerous for the people who've got it. Of course it can. So this psalm is addressing something common to most, by far the most part, of post-fall humanity. And if I say everybody, just bear in mind, I know, I know about that. But I mean most people, okay? Most people are in this situation. And it, it generates a lot of gainful activity for certain authors, doesn't it? You know, the self-help movement sprung out of this uh, sense of a lack of confidence naturally occurring, possibly quite a healthy state, in a dangerous world. Our culture thinks of it as unhealthy and undesirable to be countered by boosting self-confidence. But that can be dangerous too, can't it? Confidence. Do you know, it hasn't been very well defined, you know what confidence is? You know what confidence is, you know what confidence is, we know what confidence is, don't we? Yeah. But it hasn't been very well defined in the psychological literature, so if you want something actual, you know, right about it, it's very difficult to find out what confidence is. Uh, it comes, it comes into English from the Latin, it comes from fidere, meaning to trust, and it's defined both as a personal attribute, belief in one's own abilities, self-assurance, a personal attribute, and an external thing, you can, you can have a trust in somebody, you can be confident in them, as well as in, in, in yourself. It's not been very well defined, but the trouble is it's not been well defined, but it has been written about a lot. Can you see there's a problem there? My main observation on the Google chore I did was that there's a great rush to how to overcome a lack of self-confidence, but the question of what, what confidence is, is <laughs> the first thing, or <clears throat> the issue of whether I should be confident about myself, that, that's not a at all. So there's this big rush, I feel a lack of confidence, I should have self-confidence, and there's no analysis in between. Is that an intelligent thing to do? And the psalmist has got a completely different approach to the near universal experience of lack of self-confidence. And he gets it out and he exhibits it for our help and benefit in this psalm. But it's a completely different solution to the one that's common and, and current in our society. So you expect it to be a little bit controversial, can't you? And it shouldn't be controversial because serious psychology is beginning to catch up. There was a, a, an article in uh, rising out of a... Um, the World Service, BBC World Service program in January, and he was talking about the problem that this search for self-confidence and esteem, self-esteem is causing to people and to individuals. It's quite a brave thing. But there's this whole thing, uh, there's a book written called The Narcissism, Narcissism Epidemic. What happens when you're always trying to feel better about yourself and make yourself feel better without affecting any change 
is that you become narcissistic. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that's become, well, this super high, highly self-confident, loving yourself, believing in yourself. Um, that's, that's coming under question. <clears throat> There's been this idea that loving yourself, believing in yourself is the key to success. And that's completely not borne out by the research at all. The key to success is not feeling great about yourself. The key to success, they're finding is self-discipline. Now that's quite interesting, isn't it? Who would have thought that? Um, the guy who wrote this song, perhaps. Because that's really where scripture's coming from as well. And that's now being borne out by, by the research. Lots of stuff on that if you want to have a look at it later. Here comes the song. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? There you go. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? It kicks off, if you like, with a topic sentence. And that topic sentence expresses an absolute certainty which has the effect of banishing fear, building confidence, and it does so regardless of the scale or the extent of the threat. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Now look, this is where it's dangerous and radical, right? Because the psalmist is saying, the answer to my insecurity, the answer to my lack of confidence, is not self-confidence. The way to deal with my lack of self-confidence, I, I shouldn't have self-confidence, I know I'm like too, too well. I still have confidence in God to be able to do this with me. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I fear? So the whole thing the psalmist is saying from the very beginning, forget self-confidence, let's build God-confidence. And that's the thrust of the thing. If you forget everything else, go to sleep now, right? Just hold on to that. Because that's the nugget. That's the key to it. And we'll see why that's so essential for salvation as we, as we trickle on through this. So the source of the confidence he's working towards lies not in himself, his own innate, inbuilt abilities, or his, his own inherent, built-in qualities but in the Lord. And the face of the fear that threatens our confidence, the source of the psalmist's confidence is God himself. In particular, three aspects of God's personality make him confident about God being his, his refuge and his strength. His confidence is God-shaped, and, and it's all about God. That's the first thing. It's all about Him. It's all about stuff about Him. When you go through the self-help stuff, nothing changes. Your attitude is supposed to change. You think differently about yourself. But nothing changes except your opinion of yourself. And he's saying, look, my confidence is in the God, is in the, is in the God who changes stuff. My confidence is in the God who has the power and the authority and the whatever to be able to change stuff. Not change my mind, change stuff. Okay. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? It's all about Him. But it's not just about Him. The psalmist latches on to certain things about Him, certain bits of God's unchanging character, that give this psalmist reason for confidence in God. Firstly, light. God is light. Here we go. Here's why I can be confident in God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? First thing that comes up is light. Now, it's a piece of... You know, non-literal language again, isn't it? It's a metaphor. What does light do? Cost money, does it? <laughs> you switch it on, it costs money. Uh, what does light do? It banishes darkness. In and of itself, you switch on the light and immediately, and automatically, darkness is driven out. Yeah? The dark things are driven out. So he's using that as a bit of picture language. When God steps into a situation, when God comes in on it, the darkness is driven out. Some commentators suggest the forces of darkness are the psalmist's enemies. And that, as this looks like a royal psalm, they say the threat is that war is going to break out, plunging the land into dark days. You get the same sort of idea in Psalm 18. Well, we all have dark days, whether we're the king or not. We all have dark days. You bring God into dark days, and what happens? So switch on the light on. It drives out the darkness, says the psalmist. Here's why I can be confident. I've got the sword of God who walks into a situation and because he is very light, he dispels the darkness. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. <clears throat> the Hebrew word can mean victory, it can mean deliverance, but you're getting the general idea. 
It's suggesting God's ability to overcome whatever gets thrown at the psalmist and to pull him out of it, regardless of the odds stacked against him, regardless of the odds stacked against his success. God is the son of God who's in the business of going, whoa! So <coughs> years and years and years ago, when we were, when we were young, <coughs> and we lived on a narrow boat on the canal. And do you remember an old friend came to visit with a small child? Do you remember that? And his wife? We'll never forget that, will we? Because the boat's tied to the bank, that's great. <clears throat> and as they come to leave, a small child is about to cross from the boat onto the bank, and the boat moves away from the bank. Dad's standing with a foot on each side, and that's what kicks it off. It is Dad, no? no it's Dad. Foot on each side, and the boat started to move out, and the child went, Sploosh. I can remember the noise. <laughs> and the kid went in the water, and a big hand had to go, Whoa, come here. <coughs> I can't think of a better picture of God as Saviour. Go, oh, you're in the drink. <laughs> Come to me. Yeah. The big hand comes in. God is my light and banishes the darkness. God is my salvation when the water is over my head. The big hand comes down. And the psalmist is saying, who wouldn't be confident? He is my place of safety in every threatening context. And he's light and banishes the darkness. And he's salvation. He pulls me out of it. So we're no well placed are we to make this point. The psalmist's confidence, his confidence is God shaped. It is not religion shaped. It is shaped in the, in the form of a personality. It turns out and banishes the darkness. It's shaped in the form of a personality. He's got a big long arm. He's strong. He comes plunging in after me and pulls me out. It's not religion shaped, it's not Judaism shaped, his confidence is not even Christianity shaped, his confidence is all about him. It's, it's God shaped. It's the God who is these things. He is my confidence because he is my darkness banishing light, he is my salvation, and he himself is my stronghold, my refuge, the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now, <clears throat> it's him. That is crucial to understanding the source of a Christian's competence to deal and to live and confidence in life. It's crucial to understand why this psalm goes where it goes next. It's all about him. My confidence, yeah, it's, it's real. It, it is an issue. It needs to be addressed. But it's all about him. It's not about me. And my confidence is not me-shaped. My confidence is him-shaped. It's to do with things about him and what he's like. That's what I can be confident. It's rational, it's logical, it's pinned to things about him. And so it's a bit safer than just pinned to things about me that aren't true anyway. The consequence of him then. What the psalmist identifies as a source of legitimate, safe and secure human confidence is simply not me, it is him. It is no ism, it is no ology, it is him. Safe, secure confidence is him shipped. And my insecurity is solved exclusively, says the psalmist, with him. The consequence of him is this. He has an impact on evil men, my enemies and my foes. He has an impact on them. Jesus says you pray for your enemies. Why? Because you're going to smack them, me. Why pray for them? Because that's going to change things. You can punch them, it's not going to change them. I won't change their heart. I won't change, I promise I won't change their behaviour. Their behaviour may get worse. Try that one. He is the one who impacts situations and changes them. Now, in that verse, there's a bit of non literal language going on there in verses 2 and 3. <coughs> it's more painting pictures with words. And it looks as if the language that's being used there is the language of a pack of dogs. A pack of dogs. And you imagine yourself then, imagine yourself with a, a bunch of enemies circling you, like, like a pack of violent, ravenous, wild dogs. Looking for a way through your defences to lay hold of you, drag you down so that the whole pack can descend on you and tear you apart. Just waiting for David Attenborough to appear, aren't they? You've seen that on the telly, haven't you? There was something on a kids' programme recently I watched, and they, they had, was it, was it vultures? Oh, yeah, did he say <coughs> it's a pity it wasn't dogs because it would fit this then. But they they got this. Lunch is a long way off here. They got this skull and they put a camera inside it, okay? And they'd thrown it out with the, the sort of quarry for these animals to come and 
So you've got this sort of camera view of the skull's eye view of, of these animals just, you know, right, my enemies are like that, says the science. My enemies are like that. This pack of dogs descending on you, trying to pull you down and tear you apart. And clearly there are people around the psalmist who don't care for him or his ministry. And being surrounded by people like that, critical people, threatening people, people ripping and tearing at you, they put you off your game, you know. You're not at your best on that day. Your confidence goes pretty quick when people are at you. And it's destructive of all that is useful, all that's competent, all that's good. But he is with you, says the psalmist. And because of that, it is they, the pack of dogs themselves, that are going to stand up and fall. The consequence of it being all about him, and him being all about me, says the psalmist, is that the pack of dogs that are trying to pull me down and tear me apart, they're the ones that are going to stand up and fall. When they advance against me. Now, the trouble with situations like that is we tend to think there's something wrong or unusual going on. When people are not their best with us, when people are picking at us and when people are tearing at us and so on, as if there's something unusual going on. What's the matter with me? Here's the truth, says the psalmist. It's not an if they do this, it's a when. It's going to happen. It's going to happen to a human being in the sort of world we've got, surrounded by other human beings in the sort we've got in the world. God, that people are going to be picking and tearing at you. It's going to happen from time to time. Because of the sinful nature of human beings, it'll happen. And, and, and more, if you're the psalmist singing God songs to everybody, you're going to be really cheered up with you, not all the time for doing that. Or if you're the, the Christian standing for something in a particular situation, whatever it happens to be, the more so, it'll be the more so the case. It's not a question of if, but of when. And today there are people of Christianized culture at least, and we believe believers too, in a place like Egypt, who, who won't need this explaining to them. Because there are people around them picking and tearing at them. There are people in Syria, people in Iran, people in Cambodia, uh, Cambodia uh, North Korea. <coughs> it isn't if they advance against me. It's right. And the sight or even just the legitimate anticipation of the approach of the dog pack can be very rough on your confidence, you know. It's not self affirming When they advance against me, he says, when the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. The war break out against me. Even then, I will be... Right, so now we're being introduced to the big theme. Explicitly. Even then I will be confident. I will be confident. That's madness, isn't it? Madness. It sounds ever so slightly detached from reality. Confident? Hmm? Detached from the seriousness of the situation he's in. And but for the fact that of verse 1, this would be madness. It would be unbalanced. It would be irrational. But it is God himself who makes sense of it all. I will be confident because he, him, not just the idea of him, is my refuge and my strength. It's him. It's God himself who makes sense of it all. God as he is, the person he is, him. And that's what makes this logical. It's the consequence of him. My enemies, my foes, when they advance against me, this isn't wishful thinking. He is with me. And because of that, will be delivered by the God who is light and salvation and refuge. Well, says the psalmist, you can expect me then to be quite passionate about this God, can't you? Because he's these things to me. This great undermining personality, character, life-destroying thing, this lack of confidence thing, he is the key to that. Wouldn't you expect me to be passionate about him? Because he is the answer. My confidence is God shaped. Of course I'm going to be passionate about him. And the second part of this statement of confidence here, the psalmist makes one of the strongest statements of purpose in the Old Testament. His passion, his purpose, in view of the insecurity of his life and the character of his God, in the end of verse 4. Here's my passion, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And this is not an argument in favour of having lots of Christian meetings, right? That's not what this is about. That's, that's the way to take a metaphor and misunderstand it in your current reality. 
He wants to be in the presence of God. He's not filling in his job application to be a Levite up the temple, right? Being there all the time. Working in the building. His focus is that he wants to dwell in the presence of God. And that's his passion. What are you passionate about? It's amazing how Swansea has become much more passionate about association football in recent days. Have you noticed? Yeah. And, and the disease is no effect on Cardiff as well, I understand, but I haven't been there recently to check it out. People's passions vary and wane and wax, don't they? According to what's going on, this is a constant, settled, steady, passionate expression of the psalmist's heart. I'm passionate about being in the presence of God because he's these things to me. He's special to me. Because living in God's house, the psalmist reckons on being able to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. Do you have bad days when it's just nice to go and look at something nice? Whatever nice is for you. There are days when you just need to do something for your soul by looking at something nice. Sometimes it seems as if God's people themselves have fallen the old lie that enjoyment and beauty are the enemies of godliness. And in fact, as Christians, we are called to appreciate and, and, and glorify and enjoy God forever. Call to enjoyment, that's an interesting view of Christian life, isn't it? Well, the psalmist is up against it. When he's up against it and threatened by people all around him, snapping and tearing at him and trying to drag him down and destroy him, he seems conscious that it is God's presence that he needs and, and what captivates us, draws us and binds us to God's presence is the sheer beauty of the gaze on woman. Let's just root this a bit, because, you know, I don't do all this sort of aesthetic stuff, right? Yesterday, and that show, in the tent, nice, dry, right? And outside, a bunch of old tractors drawn up. And a bunch of old guys standing out of the rain, looking at these tractors. Mm -hmm. You and I would have seen an old Forson and an old Alice Chalmers. We saw a bunch of old tractors, but they were convinced they were gazing at a thing of beauty. Right. This is the point. They're gazing at it. And if those guys can stand in the rain gazing at a dirty, smelly old diesel burning collection of tin plate castings and bolts, then surely you and I can spend a little while gazing on the beauty of the Lord, right? And transfix through that. Even if it's raining. Psalmist longs to live in God's house because he has a passion to live in God's presence and just gaze on the beauty of the Lord. And gazing on the beauty of the God who is with you, that is an amazingly confidence building thing. As is this second thing that arises at the passion to live in God's presence, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. No, he, he doesn't want to be a Levite. That was a hereditary office in any case. As if he was referring to this temple servant who would literally, you know, spend his life within the physical precincts of the, uh, precincts of the temple of Jerusalem. It's not the idea. He is expressing the desire to live a life perpetually in God's presence. He wants to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. Because he's passionate about the presence of the God who addresses his own felt issue of confidence. To dwell in his presence is the banishment of all that. Just like turning on the light banishes the dark. There's a consequence of, of living in his presence. There's two of them, gaze on the beauty of the Lord, and to be able to inquire in his temple. <laughs> what? <laughs> What's that about? To be able to inquire in his temple. Well, how about this? There's nothing that builds confidence more than knowing what you're doing, is there? You're confident when you know what you're doing. Nothing like purpose and conviction, deep-seated confidence. That's, that's the right course of action and, and, and the one that will therefore prevail. How do you get there to knowing what you're doing? You get there by committing your way to the Lord and trusting Him to lead and guide and act so the way you take and the route that you pursue prosper. 
to the passion to dwell where God lives, has the effect of allowing affiliation, building, gazing on the presence of the Lord, and building you tighter and closer to Him. Marvelous, right? And then opening the purposes of God up to you, at least each individual's part in the purposes of God, to know what it is you're going to be doing. How does that build your confidence? Yeah, I know what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. It's a confidence building thing. So being in that presence that gives you leadership and direction and guidance and you know where you're going. To gaze on the beauty of the Lord, that's marvellous, that's really confidence building because he's with you. To inquire in his temple, that's really confidence building because it, it lets you know where it is you're going. Picking purpose and plan, and yeah, I know what I'm doing. And to be in his house, verse 5. Why, why is that such a great confidence building thing? Well, if you've got a good house, I suppose. <laughs> If as a sojourner or as a traveller stranger, you came into, oh, I was an ancient Near Eastern person, you came into my house, whose protection were you under? You were under mine, it was a serious issue. If you come to say it's a matter of my, my duty and my honour, and, and if you're under my, if you're in my house, you're under my protection. So to be in God's house, verse 5, is to be under the protection of the Almighty. He will keep me safe in his dwelling, he'll hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent, and set me high upon a rock. What's this about sacred tents? Does that very safe? A tent? Was it? Have you laid there at night on a campsite with cars moving around thinking, ooh, they're close. Have you done that? It rolls over me now, I'm squished. <laughs> the headlights come around. Yeah. I'm doing very safe in the tent. It's a reference back to the tent in the wilderness. Where the fearful presence of God was for the protection of the Israelites. He kept me safe in his wilderness tabernacle. The rock? He's talking about the temple. He's talking about the rock. If you go into Jerusalem, you look at the temple, what's it built on? Rock? Yeah. Stomping great rock comes up out of the valley of Hinnom, right? And there's this on the rock. Doosh. Good foundations. Top of the Temple Mount. That's a song you can expect all this well drawn poetic stuff to happen, can't you? And there's Passion's reward then in verse four. Passion is the presence of the Lord. He says, for all these reasons. And the way it impacts my confidence. Two things result from that passion to live in the Lord's protective presence. Deliverance from enemies. And sacrificing with shouts of joy, singing and making music to the Lord. Passion for God leads to deliverance from enemies and joyful worship. Another psalm takes a fresh direction. So here is the resolution, he says. Here is the resolution of where my confidence lies. Here is how I set about Building confidence. Confidence is God shaped in all these ways and for all these reasons. Now, what happens when your confidence is threatened? What, what happens when your confidence is a, having a difficult day and at a low end and things have happened and the dogs are all right? What do we do about that? That's what he gets to next in the second part of the psalm, and we can cover it really with not too much fuss because it's very much on the surface, it's very straightforward. The psalmist has pondered, for the sake of his confidence, on the content of verse 1. And that's what he's been doing up to the end of verse 6. And, and that's been great. But when we find life is knocking the stuffing out of us a bit, what do we do with that? Well, he sets off on a bit of a dialogue. A bit of a dialogue between talking to himself and talking to God. And he goes in and out, one to the other. So here he goes, look. Hear my voice when I call, be merciful to me and answer me. He's talking to God. Now what happens when you're praying? Are your prayers consistent and continuous and do you find that it all just goes like, oh, does your mind wander? <laughs> Everybody sort of fix their face and say, well, my prayers don't wander at all. They do, okay? And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing because God often leads us and guides us and takes us to the places in our thinking by, by that process, you know. If, if, you're, if you're not being disrespectful and sort of turning your back on somebody in the kitchen and walking away. But, but if you're just looking things through together. He, he sort of turns his back and he, he turns to himself and he says, look, my heart says, have you seen his face? 
and then he's back to God again. You'll face Lord El Si. He's motivating himself and he's praying. He's talking to himself motivationally and he's putting it into practice by praying to God about the things that are an issue to him. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn away from your servant in anger. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You've been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me. God my Saviour. And then there's this point of resolution. He's talking back to himself again. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. He's reassuring himself. This isn't words bouncing off the ceiling. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path. We're back to the direction thing. I need to know where I'm going. This addresses my confidence issue. I need to know what I'm about. I need to know what I'm doing. And then he preaches to himself again at the end. You see it? Verses 13 and 14. I remain confident of this. He's persuading himself. He's telling himself. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now here's what he's going to do. He's telling himself. He's addressing himself. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. When your confidence is battered, what do you do? You pray. That's the obvious and easy answer. But look, there's something else going on here as well. You're talking to yourself and you're putting yourself right. That's really important. The most important sermons you ever preach are to yourself, you know? Well, you expect me to say that, but, but also to sing for every single one of us. He's addressing himself so he'll be in a place where his confidence is developed. He's conscious about needing to address the issue. As well as just praying about it. Okay. There are these prayer points that he has. There are three prayer points that he has. I didn't write them down on the screen. <clears throat> Firstly, Lord, hear my voice. When your confidence is shattered, he's going to go, Lord, please hear me. Please hear me. And then, second prayer point is, don't reject me. So often our confidence gets battered because we're feeling rejected. Yeah? Don't reject me. Don't turn away from me. Leave me. And then there are three little motivational addresses that he aims at himself. My heart says, seek his face. Decision. Your face, Lord, I will seek. That's, you know, that's the, the key to a lot of these confidence issues, isn't it? Your face, I will seek. The decision that gets you there. Though my closest people receive, reject me, he will receive me. There's the next little motivational talk. And then, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, so wait for it. There's the third little motivational talk. Here's the big point of the whole thing at the end. In these two verses, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. Okay. So what are we going to take away from here about confidence then? Whatever it was, it stopped. More or less. The world about us recognizes human insecurity. It says build your self-confidence and build your self-esteem. Believe in yourself. Is there any rational basis for that at all? Because myself is not very trustworthy. The Bible says the opposite. Distrust your sinful self and trust in God. Build your confidence in Him. And one of those ways we call faith. What are we going to take away about confidence then? This whole thing has been about the psalmist and the issue of confidence and the lack of human confidence. What are we going to take away? We've got this whole, this whole issue of, of trust and distrust and what you trust. The Bible says, God is saying, don't trust in yourself. Don't think self-confidence is the answer to human feelings of insecurity and lack of confidence. It is not. Because if you go and put your confidence back in yourself again, you're going to get lack of confidence again because you're not somebody to be confident about. Yeah. Is that rational? Yes. But there is something you can be confident about. And if you put your trust in him, it's all those things that we've said he was. So, faith does this. It trusts in the God who is competent, not in the person who is not. Whether that person is me or somebody else. Christian confidence is a matter of confidence not in me, but of confidence in God. It is God-shaped. And the essence of Christian faith is to stop trusting in yourself and start trusting in God. And putting your confidence in Him. It's a faith issue. Paul talks about it in Philippians 3. He talks about not putting confidence in the flesh. Putting no confidence in the flesh. Because that's a, that's a faith issue. That's a Christian or not issue. And for Paul, for the, for the psalmist, confidence is not me-shaped, it is God-shaped. And, and we do need to take care of it, and we do need to look after it. 
But we need to do that by pursuing our relationship with Him, which is by grace through faith alone. And, and by praying directly, and by praying motivationally and talking to ourselves, both addressing God about the ways our confidence in Him is being undermined, and bolstering our resolve to put all our confidence in Him, by talking to ourselves about it, and addressing the issue in conversation with the Lord in whom we trust. And I'm sorry if that's directly countercultural, but it is biblical. And it is what the people of God have done for some very long time and not found him wanting. <clears throat>